want to tell you about a plan you can follow which takes only a little time each day, five days a week, and which brings results out of all proportion to the time spent. For a moment, consider the things your mind has brought you. Everything you have, your work, your relationship with your family and others, your philosophy of life, all come to you as a result of using your mind. Now consider the estimate made by experts. You have probably been operating on less than 10% of your mental capacities, much less. Dr. Herbert Otto, psychologist, educator, and chairman of the National Center for the Exploration of Human Potential, reminds us that many well-known scientists, such as the late Abraham Maslow, Margaret Mead, Gardner Murphy, O. Spurgeon English, and Carl Rogers, subscribe to the hypothesis that man is using a very small fraction of his capacities. Margaret Mead quotes a 6% figure. Herbert Otto writes, my own estimate is 5% or less. Neurological research at the UCLA Brain Research Institute points to enormous abilities latent in everyone by suggesting an incredible hypothesis. The ultimate creative capacity of the human brain may be, for all practical purposes, they pointed out, infinite. To use the computer analogy, man is a vast storehouse of data. But we have not learned how to program ourselves to utilize these data for problem-solving purposes. Yefremov, the eminent Soviet scholar and writer, says, man under average conditions of work and life uses only a small part of his thinking equipment. If he were able to force our brain to work at only half its capacity, we could, without any difficulty whatever, learn 40 languages, memorize the large Soviet encyclopedia from cover to cover, and complete the required courses of dozens of colleges. Now, this statement is hardly an exaggeration. It is the generally accepted theoretical view of man's mental potentialities. Now, how can we tap this gigantic potential? Well, it's a big and very complex problem with many ramifications. But as Herbert Otto points out, it is clear that persons who live close to their capacity, who continue to activate their potential, have a pronounced sense of well-being and considerable energy. They see themselves as leading purposeful and creative lives. If everything you have is the result of using just 10% of your mind, consider for a moment what it will mean to you and your family if you can increase this percentage. Now, none of us, as a rule, has the slightest notion of the real capabilities of his mind. But believe me when I say that your mind can be compared to an undiscovered gold mine. And it makes no difference whether you're 17 or 70. Look at it this way. Your goal is in the future. Your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you are now and the goal you intend to reach. This is the problem to solve. Robert Seashore, when chairman of the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University, pointed out that successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. And there you have it. Living successfully, getting the things we want from life is a matter of solving the problems which stand between where we now are and the point we wish to reach. No one is without problems. They're a part of living. But let me show you how much time we waste in worrying about the wrong problems. Here's a reliable estimate of the things people worry about. Things that never happen, 40%. Things over and past that can't be changed by all the worry in the world, 30%. Needless worries about our health, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. Real, legitimate worries, 8%. In short, 92% of the average person's worries take up valuable time, cause painful stress, even mental anguish, and are absolutely unnecessary. And of the real legitimate worries, there are two kinds. There are the problems we can solve, and there are the problems beyond our ability to personally solve. But most of our real problems usually fall into the first group, the ones we can solve if we learn how. Now I'm going to assume you've decided upon a goal. Your problem is, how do I achieve it? Your goal may be a promotion, a greater income, a beautiful home. It makes little difference what your goal happens to be. But you have your goal, and you know that you will become and you will achieve what you think about. That is, if you stay with it, you will reach your goal. But how? Well, it's right here that your mind comes into play. What is your mind? No one knows for sure. Perhaps the best way to describe it is to quote Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. In his play, The Secret of Freedom, a character says, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. That's uncomfortably true. The human mind is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the creatures on Earth. 
Anything that comes to us in the future will almost certainly come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet it's the last place on earth the average person will turn to for help. In order to reflect just a moment on the human mind, consider what it's accomplished. Human knowledge has advanced more in the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. Of all the scientists who ever lived, it's estimated that 90% of them are alive today. We've reached in the area of ideas and human advancement a plateau so high it was undreamed of by even the most optimistic forecasters as recently as 10 years ago. But every new idea triggers additional ideas so that now we're in an era of compounding advancement on every front and in every area that staggers the imagination. Dr. Harlow Shapley of Harvard has said that we're entering an entirely new age of man. He calls it the psychozoic age, the age of the mind. And you own one, free and clear. Now let's look at a few facts. Now the average working person has at his disposal an enormous amount of free time. In fact, if you total the hours in a year and subtract the sleeping hours, if he sleeps eight hours every night, you'll find he has almost 6,000 waking hours of which he spends less than 2,000 on the job. Now this leaves him 4,000 hours a year when he's neither working nor sleeping. These can be called discretionary hours with which we can do pretty much as we please. At least our minds are free. Now, so you can see the amazing results in your life, I want to recommend that you take just one hour a day, five days a week, and devote this hour to exercising your mind. Pick one hour a day on which you can fairly regularly count. And during this hour every day, take a completely blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write your present primary goal, clearly, simply. Then, since our future depends upon the way in which we handle our work, Write down as many ideas as you can for improving that which you now do. Try to think of 20 possible ways in which the activity that fills your day can be improved. You won't always get 20, but even one idea is good. Now remember two important points with regard to this. One, this is not particularly easy, and two, most of your ideas won't be any good. Now when I say it's not easy, I mean it's like starting any new habit. At first you'll find your mind a little reluctant to be hauled up and out of the old familiar rut, but as you think about your work and ways in which it might be improved, write down every idea that pops into your mind, no matter how absurd it might seem. Let me tell you what will happen. Some of your ideas will be good and worth testing. The most important thing this extra hour accomplishes, however, is that it deeply embeds your goal into your subconscious mind, starts the whole vital machinery working. And 20 ideas a day, if you can come up with that many, total 100 a week, even if you don't think on weekends. An hour a day, five days a week, totals 260 hours a year and still leaves you 3,740 hours of free leisure time. Now this means you'll be thinking about your goal and ways of improving your performance, increasing your service, six and a half full extra working weeks a year. Six and a half 40 hour weeks devoted to thinking and planning. Can you see how easy it is to rise above the so-called competition? and will still leave you with 15 hours a day to spend as you please. Starting each day thinking, you will find that your mind will continue to work all day long. You'll find that at odd moments, when you least expect it, really great ideas will begin to pop into your mind. And when they do, write them down as soon as you can. Just one great idea can completely revolutionize your work and, as a result, your life. If you want to develop the muscles of your body, you take daily exercise of some sort. Well, the mind is developed in the same way, except that the returns are out of all conceivable proportion to the time and energy spent. I've used this system for years, and it's given me some of the most gratifying and rewarding experiences of my life. And it costs only five hours a week. Five hours out of 168. Is it worth it? It's like spending five hours a week digging in a solid vein of pure gold, because your mind is all of that, and much more. Each time you write your goal at the top of the sheet of paper, don't worry or become concerned about it. Think of it as only waiting to be reached, a problem only waiting to be solved. Face it with faith and bend all the great powers of your mind toward solving it. And believe me, solve it, you will. Now let's briefly recap. This week, start spending one hour each day getting as many ideas as you can. Try for 20 a day on ways to improve what you're now doing. Remember, the achievement of your goal very likely depends upon it, as does your whole future. Two, if everything you now have is the result of using, say, five to 10% of your mental abilities, 
You can imagine what life will be like if you can increase this figure to 20% or more. Three, successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. Four, don't waste time and energy worrying about needless things. 40% of them will never happen, 30% have already happened and can't be changed, 12% are needless worries about our health, 10% are petty miscellaneous worries, and only 8% are real. Try to separate the real from the unnecessary and solve those which are within your ability to solve. Last of all, the only thing in the world that can take you to your goals in life is your mind, its effective use, and following through on the good ideas it supplies you. Each of us has a tendency to underestimate his or her own abilities. We should realize that we have, deep within ourselves, a reservoir of great ability, even genius, that can be tapped if we'll just dig deep enough. It's the miracle of your mind. A man was born who, during his lifetime, was to have a profound effect on millions of people. His name was Russell Herman Conwell. He became a lawyer, then a newspaper editor, and finally a clergyman. Well, one day, a group of boys came to Dr. Conwell at his church and asked him if he would be willing to instruct them in college courses. They wanted a college education, but lacked the money to pay for it. He told them that he'd do all he could, and. As the boys left, a thought, an idea began to form in Dr. Conwell's mind. He asked himself, why couldn't there be a fine college for poor but deserving young men? Well, here was a great idea, and he went to work on it at once. Almost single-handedly, Dr. Conwell raised seven million dollars with which he founded one of the world's leading universities. And he raised the money by giving more than 6,000 lectures all over the country, and in each one of them, he told the story called Acres of Diamonds. The story was the account of an African farmer who heard tales about other settlers who had made millions by discovering diamond mines. And these tales so excited the farmer that he could hardly wait to sell his farm and search for diamonds himself. So he sold his farm and spent the rest of his life wandering the vast African continent, searching unsuccessfully for the gleaming gems which brought such high prices on the markets of the world. Finally, in a fit of despondency, broke and desperate, as I remember the story, he threw himself into a river and drowned. Now, meanwhile, the man who had bought his farm one day found a large and unusual stone in a stream which cut through the property. And the stone turned out to be a great diamond of enormous value. And he then discovered that the farm was covered with them and it was to become one of the world's richest diamond mines. The first farmer had owned literally acres of diamonds, but had sold them for practically nothing in order to look for them elsewhere. If he'd only taken the time to study and prepare himself to learn what diamonds looked like in their rough state and had first thoroughly explored the land he owned, he would have found the millions he sought right on his own property. The thing about this story that so profoundly affected Dr. Conwell and subsequently millions of others was the idea that each of us is, at this moment, standing in the middle of his own acres of diamonds. If we will only have the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we'll usually find that it contains the riches we seek, whether they be financial or intangible or both. There's nothing more pitiful to my mind than the person who wastes his life running from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. No matter what your goal may be, perhaps the road to it can be found in the very thing in which you're now engaged. You see, the average man believes some businesses are better than others, instead of realizing the truth that there are no bad businesses. There are just those people who don't know enough to see the opportunities in the work they're in. 
no matter what our work happens to be, it's our business. We're the manager. If there seems to be no future or opportunity in it, it isn't always because it's not there, but perhaps only because we can't see it. A farmer once poked a tiny pumpkin into an empty jug. The pumpkin grew until it completely filled the jug and could grow no more. When the farmer broke the glass, he had a pumpkin exactly the size and shape of the jug. If we're not careful, each of us can do a similar thing. We can mistakenly poke ourselves into jugs that limit our growth. But it is we who do the poking, not the job, not the company, nor the territory, nor the economy, nor the times. We do it. People who become outstanding at their work are those who see their work as an opportunity for growth and development and who prepare themselves for the opportunities which surround them every day. Preparation is the key. This means becoming so good, so competent at what we're now doing, we will actually force the opportunities we seek to come our way. It takes imagination, creative imagination, to know that diamonds don't look like diamonds in their rough state, nor does a pile of iron ore look like iron or steel. Great opportunities lurk constantly in every aspect of the work in which we now find ourselves. In order to begin prospecting your acres of diamonds, start to develop a faculty called intelligent objectivity, the ability to stand off and look at your job as a stranger might, a stranger who considers your pasture greener than his own. To do this, start at the beginning. Within the framework of what industry or profession does your job fall? Do you know all you can know about your industry? How did it begin? Why did it begin? Who started it and when? What's your industry's annual dollar volume? How fast has it grown during the past 20 years? What's his projected growth during the next 10 years? In short, start now to become a student of your industry. You'll be amazed at the results. In five years or less, you can become a national expert in your field. And it's the experts who write their own tickets in life. Surveys indicate that the great majority of people seem to look at their jobs as being as far as they can go, as the end of the line. They need to realize how really desperately an expanding and dynamic industry needs and seeks the uncommon person who is prepared to share in its growth, how richly it will reward this person of vision and action. On the other hand, those who are not preparing and growing are not just standing still. In relation to their industry, they're going backwards. So ask yourself, do I know as much about my job and my industry as a good doctor or lawyer knows about his job, his profession? You should, you know. This is the attitude of the person who wants to become a professional at what he does for a living. It's far more fun, many times more rewarding and interesting, and the real pro can ride out occasional storms in the economic seas in a safe boat built of research and preparation. In order to become a professional in a world of amateurs, we need to study three important subjects. One, our company and the industry in which it operates. Two, our job and perhaps the next step upward in our career. And three, we need to study people, since successfully serving and getting along with people will determine our success or failure. These are three subjects on which you can gradually build a fine home library. Your bookstore clerk will help you find the right books if you'll tell him what you want to know. Frequently, all you need in order to make an enormous improvement is simply a reminder of things you've known but have forgotten. Perhaps this study and research in your job, your industry, and ways of increasing your service to others sounds like a big job. Well, it is, but it's fascinating, and in the long run, it pays tremendous dividends, builds complete security, and it can be accomplished in an hour a day devoted to reading and making permanent notes. Think of ways and means by which you can increase your contribution to your company, your industry, and those whom you serve. You'll begin to notice a wonderful change in your world, for as ye sow, so shall ye reap. This applies just as much to the family as it does to the breadwinner. The minute you adopt this attitude, you've joined the top 5% of the people of the world. You've virtually removed all competition. You're creating rather than competing. You're affecting life rather than just being affected by it. You're becoming a creator and a giver to life instead of just a receiver. By taking this attitude toward your work, your company and industry, you're automatically taking care of two vital parts of successful living. First, you'll find yourself becoming more interested and enthusiastic about your work and its future, and both interest and enthusiasm are contagious. And second, you're building financial security which will last a lifetime. So keep this thought in mind as often as you can on and off the job. 
somewhere in your present work, there lurks an opportunity which will bring you everything you could possibly want for yourself and your family. It will not be labeled opportunity. It will be hidden in common, everyday garments, just as was the hairpin with which a man fashioned the first paper clip, or the dirty drinking glass which triggered the paper cup industry. Now, in closing, here are 12 points to remember. One, if we'll develop the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we will very likely find it contains the riches, tangible and intangible, we seek. Two, before we go running off into what we think are greener pastures, let's realize our own pasture is probably unlimited. Three, there are no bad jobs. It's the way in which we go about our work that makes it good or bad. Four, let's not poke ourselves into jugs beyond which we cannot grow. Let's avoid self-limitation. Five, only preparation can ensure our taking advantage of the opportunities which will present themselves in the future, opportunities which are around us now. Let's begin to prepare now. Six, put your imagination to work on the many ways and means of improving what you're now doing. Seven, learn all you can about your job, your company, and your industry. Eight, since there's no limit to the growth of your industry, it must follow there's similarly no limit to your growth potential within that industry. Nine, our dynamic and growing economy needs and will well reward the uncommon person who prepares for a place in its growth. Ten, begin to build your library of reference material pertaining to your company, industry, job, and on how to better serve and get along with people. Eleven, set aside an hour a day for this study and research. Twelve, remember the story of the Acres of Diamonds. <laughs>